Hello and welcome to this week's Different League show sponsored by Betfred. Thank goodness 2020 is almost out of the way. What can we expect in 2021? Just please tell us football will continue. Simon Grayson, I'm sure, will be desperate for football to continue. He's alongside Mark Landon and myself. Si, how are you? How all was good. Christmas? Yeah, all good, thank you. Quiet, yeah. watching a bit of football. A lot of football or just a bit of football? Mm, that and a few dramas and uh, soap, soaps as well. But uh, yeah, it's been, uh, it's been different, as we all know. Um, but it gives you opportunity to watch a bit of football and take stock of the situation. Yeah, have a few little cheeky drinks as well, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, moving swiftly on, this week's big talking points. Look, we're all desperate to get back to some kind of normality, but it looks like things will get worse before it gets better. The latest round of Premier League testing, 18 people had the virus. That is the highest figure recorded in the league's testing programme. I have to say that came from nearly 1,500 tests between December the 21st and the 27th. But how worried are you going forward about more and more games called off? We've seen it happen or happening in the EFL, certainly in League One. And obviously now with what happened, Everton, Manchester City as well. Yeah, obviously, there just seems to be a lot of inconsistency why the games are off. You look at certain situations for Team A and they have one or two cases and then a similar club have um, the similar numbers of, of the COVID and, and not allowed to have the game called off. It's... It's difficult because we've seen some managers, I think Oli Gunnar Solskjaer has come out and said he wants there not to be a circuit breaker. Sam Allardyce is desperate for one. That's maybe got something to do with his team uh, losing 5-0 and getting some time on the training ground. Well, well he, he said that, but he also said, I'm 66. Um, I, I'm concerned for myself. I mean, what do you make of that? It, it, choose my words carefully here, but he's, he's come into a position where he knows COVID's yeah. already around. And now he's saying a two-week circuit breaker. What would that do? And what do you make of those comments and, and the idea of a circuit breaker anyway? Well, I think sometimes when you're interviewed straight after a game, sometimes you don't ultimately say the things that you would say the next day when you've had a chance to have a clear head and think about a situation. Um, yeah, Sam knew exactly what he was getting into going back to work. It's great to see him back into work because he's a character. He, he says it as it is. He's a proper old school manager. Um, but ultimately, sometimes people want a circuit breaker because they're doing well. Uh, sorry, they're not doing well, and others don't want a circuit breaker because they've just done a good run. So they, they like are an international break. Isn't yeah, it, I think teams want to use it to their own advantage. Good or bad situations we're in at the moment, but ultimately it's all about the safety of everybody. If the numbers keep increasing, then you would have to there would have to be a serious thought that there might have to be one because people's welfare and health is far more important than, than football at this moment in time. Mark, what are your thoughts on this? And, and what are the rules? I mean, Simon's brought it up. I don't, <laughs> I don't know what the rules I don't, are, I don't, <laughs> whether a game gets called I, off or not. No, I, I, I don't know the rules either. I'm not sure anybody does. And, you know, Everton have asked for sort of full disclosure. I think some of it does come down to the fact that they're not quite sure sort of if they kind of got all of the people sort of um, sort of nailed down you know it can take a while for the testing results to come through so Man City knew they had a significant number um, there may well have been more and what I remember a game between um, Napoli and Genoa in Italy at the start of the season Genoa had two players that were were ruled out for Covid by the midweek they'd had 12 tested positive and then Napoli weren't able to play their next game against Juventus and were deducted points because they didn't travel. They've since got that, 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 that point back. But um, I think that's probably the concern is that if that game goes ahead, Everton against Manchester City, and then all of a sudden Everton uh, have got you know widespread as well, then um, you, you, I think Premier League is made to look really sort of foolish. So I think you have to be you have to be sort of careful and you know that the welfare um, has to come first. I'm just not sure if it's if somebody could sort of give me the facts on sort of what a circuit breaker would do, then mm. then, then fine. But I mean, just doing one um, just because you think it might work, I, I, it doesn't. What's going to change sense. in two weeks? Exactly. Uh, you know, and then I think once you stop, how do you restart? I, I think that you know it took a long while to to re that project restart. Before I also think that clubs have maybe become a little bit more lax in how they've kind of been in their bubbles. Um, if you remember when uh, they first came back. Um, people were get, traveling up north or, or from London, say, on the day. They were using uh, cars rather than coaches. That seems to have calmed down a little bit, and we may need to get back to that kind, those kind of sort of bubbles, really, um, which are not very practical, but, but maybe sort of keep the show on the road. The Premier League has all, 
always had kind of stringent testing and they've had more tests as well. And we'll find out as we speak, we don't yet know the results of those tests. The EFL, it is very different. I think it's all to do with finance. If you were a manager, what would your thoughts be if you were asked the question about a circuit breaker and, and, and how possibly we do deal with this? Look, I think there's enough money in football, so why can't that money be generated into the EFL for this specific time of of the pandemic where you, the players can be tested more, then we would, and people would have more of an idea of, of where they are on a regular basis. I think that, that, that that's money that could be used wisely as well. Um, but I agree with what Mark had said as well, that I think society has gone a little bit sort of slack and hence why the, the cases have risen. Footballers have got a little bit, not blase with it, that's probably a little too over the top, but complacent is maybe a, a word you could use. Would I want a circuit breaker? Well, it touches on how severe you, you are with your group and, and where you are as well. You can use it to your advantage. So if, it, it, that would come into consideration I, as look, to what the, you would say. The health of everybody is for, first and foremost without yeah. a shadow of doubt. And, and if, if you are given a clean bill of health and you are then given the opportunity to have a circuit break or not, I think it would depend on where you are in the division and how your results have been recently. Spoken like a manager. <laughs> you can see he's still a manager even now. Um, okay. Uh, let's move on to Mauricio Pochettino as well, Mark, because we've spoken a lot about Solskjaer versus Pochettino, who would be best for Manchester United, what's going to happen with them. How close is he now to the to the PSG job and what could that mean for Oli? He's desperate, isn't he? <laughs> I think the there'll be a, there will be a few teams, um, that there are a few managers around in the Premier League thinking, oh, that, that's nice. Um, I, I, yeah, I expect Pochettino to take that Paris Saint-Germain job now. I think it's very very close and it sort of always was the moment that Tuchel got the sack on or reported it was Christmas Eve really when he found out that he was no longer wanted. Pochettino's got a really close link with Paris Saint-Germain he played for them um, you know was um, not necessarily idolised by the fans but there's definitely a close connection there and he's somebody that likes that connection and I, I think he'll bring the supporters once they're allowed back in and, and the team sort of closer together again and, and sort of really do well from that side, side of things. From the outside, it doesn't look like an obvious sort of path where he would enjoy necessarily managing some of them players and the way that they like to bring in a certain type of player and the sort of people that Pochettino likes to work with. I think it's quite different. And so it will be interesting to see whether he can get... Uh, I really like Neymar. I think he's over-criticised. But it will be interesting to see whether he can get somebody like Neymar to do the running that is required to work for a Pochettino-type team. You're smiling there, aren't you? <laughs> we'll take a bit. But he is a good, very good man manager. Yeah. Let, let's, let's touch on Pochettino. What do you think about possibly him going to PSG? Or do you think that perhaps he would be better in a role at Manchester United, which we have to say someone's already there? And actually, I think is dealing with it yeah. incredibly well with all the criticism. How do you see all of that? Well, it, it's a real balance that as managers, you've, you want to go back to work. You want the right opportunity, and if you're waiting for a certain job, it might not come up for a particular time. Manchester United have just gone second in the in the Premier League, so I do not think that job will come available very soon. So what happens if um, Oli keeps on doing really well? He's not got a chance of, for another 6, 12, 18 months of that job. Yeah. PSG is a, a massive job, isn't it? I think, mm. he, I think he'll end up going there and potentially do a good job there and then come back to the Premier League in a few years' time, I think. I think that's where he'll end up. He should win a trophy. He should, he should get that sort of... Get that monkey off his back. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. OK, interesting if uh, United struggle a bit in the Premier League, <laughs> they get knocked out in the Carabao <laughs> Cup. And also uh, against Real Sociedad, which is a tough like one. Like you Juventus, um, Barcelona struggling at the moment. There yeah. could have been some other jobs around, but... Um, yeah, I think as Simon says, you've got to take the, a big one when it becomes yeah, available. and it is a big one. OK, final one, because it is the end of the year. And of course, we know that football seasons don't work in years, they work in seasons. So you can choose this year or you can choose this season. It's up to you. Just interested in your thoughts. Could be club, player, manager. One, who's done well. Two, who must do better. And three, what has pleased you most generally? For me... Being a league supporter, I'm going to say Marcello Bielsa and Leeds United. First and foremost, to get from the Championship into the Premier League after 16 years, there's been many of us have tried <laughs> that. Uh, <laughs> how, to, tough, to, how tough is it, that job? It's, it's really tough. And I got to seventh in the division and with a bit more backing, we had a good opportunity. 
And then it's just been a, a gradual just process of not getting anywhere really close until Bielsa came in and got to the playoff semi-final when they should have really got to the final after being in front, but full credit to Derby. But then to go again and and what he's brought to the club and to the city, it's been fantastic. And so you put all them factors together, getting out of the championship and now how they've just embraced the Premier League. Leeds United was everybody's second team that they hated. And and now it's like as if it's like the, the second team everybody loves because of the style of football. They're going to play exactly the same way all season. He's not going to change any of his ideas, beliefs. As Gabby Abanglaho said once, he, he isn't a myth. <laughs> 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 he's uh, he's actually proving that he's a good manager with the results that he's had. They're still going to have some ups and downs over now before the end of the season. And the six-two against Manchester United was was there for everybody to see but then responded really well. So I think the, for them to do that is, and me being a league supporter as well, a bit of favouritism, mm. uh, that's been my highlight of 2020. Understandably so. Who's done well for you? I'm going to go Grealish. I, I just feel like he's taken... I mean, I, Villa fans will say he was always um, just good. I think he has got... And I liked him in the Championship and, and sort of when he first came back to the Premier League, but I think he's taken his game up and beyond that kind of level now to where he is one of the best players in the Premier League. Um, I mean, Gary Agbonga was saying one of the, last week on last week's show, um, he was saying to me he's one of the best players in the world. Um, so mm. um, he's... Uh, now that is a myth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is slightly biased, yeah. that one. But in, mean, in the essay, he like it, isn't he? But I tell you what, he's I mean, some player. La- last week, I, the, the game against Crystal Palace, uh, when Watkins hit the post, he put a pass through to him yeah. um, that was just... So delicious and so brilliant, and you know he's he's found a role off the left hand side that I think really suits him. Everybody is obsessed with trying to get him into that number ten role, but I think you can hide a little bit out there and sort of you can cover his defensive. He doesn't have to do quite as much defensive work, and he finds a lot of space in that position. And um, I just think he's just getting better and, and better. I think when you talk about that role he's played now rather than the central one, there's a lot of teams play three in the middle, so they can more or less go man to man. When he drifts, when he starts out on the on the outsides, he can then get into pockets where right backs don't really want to go. We've played fullback, and you, when a, some, a winger goes into an area, you're thinking, "Well, do I go or don't go?" And if you do go, and it's the wrong decision, Premier League played the spacing behind you. And then if you don't go, he can go and do the magic. So he's he's been fantastic. Yeah, hasn't he, he asks questions. Mine is uh, his manager, Dean Smith. Yeah, you know, after what sure. happened at the end of last season. Just about stayed up. A lot of criticism with the amount of money being spent. Clearly, it wasn't down to him. I think he's been given a lot more power. The recruitment's been great. I think he's been able to get the best out of his players, and I'm really pleased to see him him doing yeah, up there. So, for me, Dean Smith, who must do better? Well, I'm going to drop to the Championship. I'm going to go to the two East Midland clubs, Derby County and Nottingham Forest, both in them relegation areas, both got big budgets, both got um, big reputations, history and tradition. Nobody's got any divine right to be at the top end of, of any division, but for two clubs like that to be where they are is, 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 I think they're totally underachieved. Especially Derby, when you look at, they were in the playoff semi-finals last year and to go horribly, so horribly wrong. Obviously, they had a great result in midweek against um, Birmingham, um, but them two should be a lot higher in the division. It's very competitive as a championship, but um, yeah, they're, they're my two in, uh, in the championship. I was going to chuck Bolton in there because they're having a real um, nightmare at the moment in League Two, but I'm actually going to go right towards the top of European football and, and say Manchester City, um, just because uh, their standards they have set are so high and I used to absolutely love watching them play. I don't get that excited about watching them at mm-hmm. the moment. and I know that it, it's hard, there's been no pre-season, um, players are tired, Aguero's been <coughs> missing. But they don't excite me as much. And Pep got it. Maybe it'll work. And this new sort of defence first that they're, they're kind of going for and they're keeping a lot more clean sheets. But I just, I want to see them back to being the fun Manchester City of previous. And I think they need to do better than in the Premier League and in the Champions League. I mean, to get knocked out in the last couple of years by Tottenham and by Lyon, uh, it's not really good enough for a team that's got that quality. Yeah, they're my pre-season favourites, as you well know. I've changed already. <laughs> I, I, they've really dis- I, I love Pep Guardiola. I love everything about him, but really been disappointed with the, almost the lack of reaction to losing the, the Premier League title. But look, they're still not out of it. It's yeah. a strange season. Um, I was going to go Arsenal and then back-to-back wins. <laughs> <laughs> kind of put that out of the way. So I'm going to go for Paul Pogba. I mean, when are we going to see mm. the talent that we know he has on a consistent basis? 
in a Manchester United shirt. And I actually don't think we're going to see it. I no. think he'll be gone in the summer, which would be a, a real shame to him, United, and the Premier League as well. So, um, yeah, disappointed that it seems like it's not going to work out for him. And, and just quickly as well now, what's pleased you most generally this year? Um, I'll go with another individual, when Marcus Rashford, the work that he's done both on the pitch, but most notably off it as well. With, it's a high-profile player who's done uh, remarkably well for, for lobbying against the government to get uh, all this help for, for school kids' meals, etc. And, and I think for somebody to take that on board, as well as playing for Manchester United, <laughs> takes some responsibility. Yeah. So uh, I think he's a, a shining light for everybody in this year. I'm going to go for the fact that football restarted because I think there was a time when in sort of March, April, when I wasn't sure that it was. And that first game back that I saw Borussia Dortmund against Schalke, I think it just gave hope to everybody that, you know, we can do it. I know there are problems now at the moment, but, you know, we finished, or certainly in terms of Champions League, Premier League, Championship, finished a lot of last season. I think more than many thought that we would. Yeah. And we're still going, um, albeit it's sort of hopefully not stopping, but it, um, you know, we are still going. Mine's the same to that. So I'll just, I'll just add that the attitude of everyone trying to get back, and it is important to, to not be blasé, as we talked about with the testing and that. But I do hope, because I think it's so important to the local communities, to, to mental health for a yeah. lot of people as well, that football is, is on the box and, and is watchable, if, even yeah. if not, we can't go to the stands. OK, let's have a look at this week's social section, shall we? Uh, where we take a look at some of the funny posts or things that have happened across the week. Um, Raul Jimenez in the stand at Wolves, and it's fantastic to see he is back. He won't be back on the pitch for some time. But look, we wish him all the very best in his continued recovery. But it leads to, could there be return, a Premier League return, to Diego Costa? Because his contract's terminated at Atletico Madrid. They need a, a striker. There's also Arsenal and Chelsea being linked with him. I can't see the Chelsea one, but how do you see it? Well, I, uh, I think Wolves need somebody um, just to, to be that, that focal point uh, for be careful them. careful what you say now. No, <laughs> yeah, Mendes has got that relationship. <laughs> well, we're, the, the, that little triangle will work quite well. He, he does a lot of deals with Atletico and Wolves and, and, and certain players. And I think that he would be that kind of, just to help Fabio Silva, who looks like he's got something about him, good movement, but you know, I, I think they need somebody to just play up there while Jimenez is out. And Diego Costa's not as good as he was in his first Chelsea spell, but he still offers something to a team, say, like Wolves, mm -hmm. that are mid-table at the moment, but probably could still kick on towards that top six, not that far away. I think the problem is that if he goes to Wolves, he's going to need an interpreter. So somebody, <laughs> so somebody like Steve Bull, <laughs> who's a legend in them parts. He's brilliant. I can't understand, bully him to understand him. Yeah, we find it hard to understand him as well, but... Uh, yeah, he'll get the interpreter in there. But, but it does could that be a good move? For you? Yeah, I think so. And Wolves. Wolves are a big football club, and he want, if he wants to come back to the Premier League, like you said, I don't see him going to to Chelsea. I think signed that many in the summer and in, in the previous seasons. I don't think that's going to happen. Arsenal, again, you, you don't know. It's possibly a, an agent playing his part, getting the big clubs involved, and maybe just creating a little bit more interest elsewhere. But it'd be, I think it'd be great to see him. Back in the yeah. Premier League, and a club like Wolves probably was a good fit because they're a hard-working team, and uh, he'll, ruff, he'll ruffle a few feathers, won't he? That's <laughs> for sure. Well, even if he's not the same player, he's a character. Isn't oh. he? It'd be great to have him back. Yeah. Well. Okay, let's go to the different league Q and A section where you get a chance to win a twenty-five pound Amazon voucher if you get your questions read out. And this week to Simon, uh, Racing Clips 04 has a question for you. If there's one thing you dislike about being a manager, what is it? <laughs> Lots of things. Um, isn't there? Well, probably social media. <laughs> <laughs> the scrutiny probably that you put under. I think um, that's the biggest changing point since I when I started off as a manager 15, 16 years ago. That the social media aspect of it all was was non-existent, really, wasn't it? Now every manager up and down the country is scrutinised for team selections, substitutions, formations, to then how are you playing and not being entertaining enough. Um, so it's probably the media side of it all that, unfortunately, if you don't go in it, then you don't see what people are saying about you, do you? Yeah. Have you seen a difference uh, with owners who are on social media oh. as well and how difficult is that? But have you also seen a difference with players 
but it seems to have more of an ego now. It used, used to be just in the, the top division. Now it's almost yeah. League One and League Two. They've yeah, it does make you league. laugh when you see certain things on the uh, on Twitter and that, and it's always the same sort of things. Um, Disappointing for the fans, let's go again next game and <laughs> stuff like that. Owners do play a big part on, in social media the, on the, in terms of the forums, etc. I think a lot of decisions to get rid of managers do take place on them forums and some of them people behind the keyboards have probably not been to a game for a long, long time. But um, an owner, if he's getting criticised of the manager, what's mm. he going to do? He's mm. going to look after himself, isn't he? So when you get back in, go with an owner who's not on social not media. Uh, Bob Carey, two for you, Simon. One, Leeds United, destined for Champions League or Championship? Somewhere in between. <laughs> I, I don't think they'll go down. I said from from the start of the, the season that they would be halfway, I think, quite comfortably. Um, Champions League is probably going to be too much. It's, they're going to be probably a little bit too inconsistent. Probably haven't got the strength in depth and the quality. Staying in the in the Premier League is the first and foremost thing that you have to do when you get promoted. So if they finished halfway, potentially challenging for the Europa places, then that'll be an absolute added bonus for them. So uh, yeah, halfway will do. Okay. Uh, the second one is, you were in my team when my beloved Stockport County lost 4-0 to Spurs <laughs> in the FA Cup 20 years ago this February. Wow. The defeat lost me £20 at the bookies. Will you consider reimbursing me? <laughs> <laughs> well, it must have been foolish because wh why are you putting £20 on Stockport to beat Tottenham <laughs> or, or whatever? You know what I mean? It's uh, yeah, I remember the game, to be fair. Champ Stockport weren't where they are now. We were, they were in the Championship at the time and we went there and uh, I didn't, I couldn't remember the result, but I wasn't playing in that back four. I was playing in midfield in <laughs> well, them yeah. days. So I just blamed didn't the rest of them. give him any protection. No, so the other four can go and give him a five pound each. Yeah. So he had nothing to do with me. I kept the clean sheet from where I was. <laughs> Bob, I have to say that that's a silly bet. We always talk about gambling yeah. responsibly. That was not gambling <laughs> yeah. responsibly. He's been reimbursed anyway. He's got his Amazon voucher. He has, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So congratulations to Bob and to Racing Clips, a 25 pound Amazon voucher. He's five pound up then, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. Well, he can pass it on to me. Then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be coming to you soon. Okay, let's uh, preview the games now, shall we? And first up, and it's a it's a game tonight. It's one you're going to be at as well. Doing yep. some travelling, aren't you, at the moment? Yeah, certainly am. Uh, Newcastle Liverpool, iconic Premier League game of the past. But look, look, in one of the strangest years ever, we've seen one of the strangest results, and that's Liverpool not winning at home to West Brom. Yeah. What, what did you make of them? I mean, Big Sam loves Anfield, but what did you make of Liverpool? They, they just weren't as clinical um, and couldn't break them down, could they, for like, to get the second goal? We all talk about the second goal being so crucial, and you know 1-0 going into the last 10 minutes, Sam's got the big big centre-backs on there and a set-piece coming to, his, to, to, uh, to, to play advantage for them. Um, so it was just one of them games that... It probably puts it in perspective, doesn't it? Then West Brom play Leeds and get done five and you'll have to mm. go into Anfield. And you look at West Brom, their mentality has been good against the bigger teams recently, um, drawing against Manchester City. But Liverpool probably um, didn't play as well as they could do, weren't as clinical, didn't pass the ball around as quickly as they needed to do in around that 18-yard box where it matters and where all the bodies were, as Jurgen Klopp had said, he wasn't quite sure if there was eight or seven playing at the, in the back uh, defence unit. Um, but you see him tonight going up to Newcastle, um, still win the game, I think. It won't be like the games that we've had in the past where it's been four threes and that. I think Liverpool could will win tonight 2-0. Uh, Mane took his goal really well the other night against West Brom. Um, so it's, yeah, I think I think Liverpool will be back on track tonight. Mark, how do you see it? Yeah, I think, I think Liverpool will um, win pretty comfortably. Um, you know, from Newcastle's point of view, I mean, Steve Bruce has come out and said, look, you know, mind, he actually has got... Put the pressure on Mike Ashley a little bit now. I think he's fed up of taking all the flack, saying um, he's come out and publicly said, "Look, my job is to keep Newcastle up. That's that's all that sort of really is being asked of me." Um, they, I'm, I think they're lucky to have the points that they have. You look back to some of the games where they've been dominated, like against Spurs when they they, they nicked a result and and stuff like that. I don't think they've played well for a long time. I think that he said that COVID's had a big impact on them, and some mm. of the players just haven't responded well to that. Um, you know, when they lose as well, they, they tend to lose by sort of a handsome margin. So I think it might be um, a, a worrying sort of Christmas and New Year period for Newcastle. So what's your prediction? Uh, Liverpool minus one. All of Newcastle's defeats this season have been by at least two goals in the Premier League. OK, yeah, I think Newcastle would take a nil-nil right now. Sure. But a champions bounce back, don't they? I'm going for Liverpool to win both halves.
Uh, game preview two is the Friday night football. It's Manchester United against Aston Villa. It should be a good game this. I mean, United nicked a result against Wolves last night, but they're second in the table, just two points off uh, Liverpool. Are, are they title contenders? Well, the second in the in the division, aren't they? So they've got to be considered it. When we're doing the research on this game, it, what I've said going into the Aston Villa game was more or less what happened last night. I, I can see it being another real tight game. Dean Smith done fantastic at Aston Villa, very defensively, very strong, not conceded too many goals, got a great result at, at uh, Chelsea in midweek as well. Um, but you just see Manchester United just nicking the result. I can't see it being like a Leeds game that's open and free-flowing football and plenty of goals and, and opportunities. I think it's going to be probably like it was last night, uh, the game against Wolves, where it's late on. I see Man United just nicking it 1-0 now. What have you made of, of Dean Smith and, and Aston Villa? Because you talked about the balance, and he, he really has got the balance, hasn't he, between defence and attack? Yeah, I think you mentioned it since um, the, the end of last season. The recruitment has been really good. He's, um, he's looked into, into players that can really fit into the mould how he wants to play. And, and it takes you two or three transfers window, to windows to really get your group of players together, have the influence and the impact on them. And they have, they've had the balance right when you talk about Jack Grealish, Ollie Watkins and uh, El Ghazi has been on fire, hasn't he? He's plenty of goals. Um, I just don't think they might have enough to go and break Man United down at uh, Old Trafford. But full credit to Dean, he's done a fantastic job. Mm. And Jack Grealish and Bruno Fernandes, two of the best players in the Premier League right now? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think what they offer um, the, the team is just so much in terms of Goals, particularly from uh, Fernandez's point of view, I think that's maybe the next step for for Grealish if he can, um, you know, take it to sort of sort of superstardom level. Like he, he probably does need to add a, a few more goals to to his game. Fernandez gets a lot, a lot of sort of uh, penalties as well, but I think with Fernandez, you see the, the quick passing that he does that really sort of sets alight that United attack because before he arrived, it was all too slow, and you know, whether it Rashford or. Greenwood or whoever, that they just weren't getting that ball out quick enough. And Fernandez so often looked for a first time pass or a first time just a little touch around the corner. And and Grealish does it differently because he likes to hold on to the ball, but I think he's learning to release it at exactly the right time and uh, looking forward to seeing them both in action. I still can't get over the lack of shin pads that he has. <laughs> 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 well, <laughs> only us, halfway through. Us two being defenders, you know, <laughs> we'll, we'll be tra- trying to tackle all yeah. 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 Just above the shin pad area. <laughs> <laughs> so Betfred selection here apart from people getting uh, a yellow card Jack Grealish. <laughs> I w- I'm going to go for 1-0 one to- one Manchester United and as Matt said Bruno Fernandes is on uh, on top form with assists but also goals as well so him to score probably a late, late winner like they did uh, in the previous game. I'm going to go for Aston Villa or draw a double chance so for Aston Villa not to lose the game I think United had a really hard game against uh, Wolves Villa have had longer um, to-, to recuperate they're really solid defensively and got a little bit on the counter-attack. I think mm. this could be a really tricky game for United. Yeah, I, I don't know whether it's going to be a really open game, but I do think it will be a really interesting game. And, and Villa, the way they're playing at the moment, I think they can more than hold their own. And with the extra day's rest, much needed at the moment, I'm going to go for a draw here. OK, uh, game preview three on Saturday. It is Spurs against Leeds United. And so, what a result for Leeds last night. 5-0 West Brom. Yeah, look, they're backed up... Um, the, the disappointing result um, at Old Trafford with a one 0 win against Burnley at the weekend, and then to win five nil, they were just well, they were just back to the best what we've seen at glimpses of them over the course of the season so far. Very clinical in what they did. They have had a tendency to create chances but miss them. But last night there were some fantastic goals. They played with a real purpose. They pressed probably a little bit higher up the pitch than they have done recently, and, and West Brom just couldn't live with them, could they? Um, so it was back to back to winning ways for them um, and a real mark of intent of where they want to go with. Um, but this is going to be this is going to be a, a, a different type of game. I think this will suit Tottenham more than it will probably Leeds because we know that Jose likes to sit back and counter attack at home. So I think they'll be defend deep will Tottenham and Leeds will push bodies forward which they've done all season and against the better teams they've just struggled on that overturn of possession and the counter-attack. We saw it against Leicester early in the year where they got beat 4-1. Um, Manchester United obviously got them 6-2. I fancy Tottenham to do them on the counter-attack a couple of times, but I still think Leeds will score. So I'm going to go for a, 
a 2-1 Tottenham win, as much as it hates me to say it, um, and with Son probably scoring, because I think with his pace and ability, there might just be a little bit more space for him to go and hit them on the counter-attack. Yeah, I think there's a type of game that will suit Jose. I mean, first of all, for Leeds, 5-0 at West Brom, 5-2 against Newcastle, lose 6-2 at Old Trafford. They are becoming, you, you said it really well, they used to be the, the second team everybody <laughs> hated. Now they're almost the second team everybody loved. Great to watch under Bielsa, but also... And we're speaking here, Spurs haven't played Fulham yet, but we'll have to wait and see where that game's on. I did find it interesting that Jose Mourinho had a go at his team last week, (laughs) saying you had 89 minutes to score a a second goal when they're set up to protect a lead. Or might be an anti-Jose here. No, I think it it was really interesting because a couple of weeks ago it was my boys are this and my boys are that. And um, he's sort of separating himself from them after a, a, a bad spell, which was a criticism, I think, of Jose Mourinho, certainly in more recent times, particularly at Manchester United, when things didn't go well. He didn't take his share of responsibility. It's unlike Jose, to take the credit when he's there and distance himself when it's there. At Molyneux, the first sub was was a very positive one because um, he he brought on Bergwijn to try to get Tottenham up the pitch and then the next two substitutions were defensive ones. So, I mean, he has to take his um, share of of, of the blame, I suppose. We don't know what he said at half-time. Maybe he was saying, you know, You've got to push up, mm. um, but they haven't done that for a while and they keep getting caught, um, so it's not working. This this idea of we'll sit on the one nils, whether it's the players, whether it's Mourinho, a combination of both, it's not working um, because I think it's okay to be defensive, but you've got to keep possession better, which they haven't been doing, and you've got to still offer a threat on the counter-attack because if you don't, you're just inviting Wolves and Crystal Palace, not the sort of two most attack-minded teams in the league, but they could sort of throw more men forward because Tottenham offered so little as a counter-punch. OK, so what's your bet for selection? We've got Simons. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go for Tottenham to win um, and over two and a half goals in, in this game. I totally agree that it, it's a match that suits Spurs, particularly with no fans in, because they won't even have to, to push forward and leads to 4-3 against Liverpool, 3-1 at Chelsea. The other games that Simon mentioned, um, there's a bit of a pattern developing there in big games. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you. I mean, Mourinho can't rely on the clean sheet and the way he leads attack. They do score goals, but I do think they'll be very open. This is a game that Mourinho will absolutely love. So both teams to score, but Spurs to win for me. OK, West Brom against Arsenal. And I'm like, what on earth did the Arsenal players eat on Christmas Day? Because it was no win in the league. They were all massively under pressure. Mikel Arteta too. Suddenly back-to-back victories and, and two very different wins as well, weren't they? They were. I, I think that... A little bit of luck goes a, a long way. So against Chelsea, I think they deserved the win, but Chelsea have given them a penalty. There's a free kick and a cross um, that have gone in. And Arteta, that was maybe what he was talking about when, when he was bringing out all the, the stats bef- before that Chelsea game. And just in terms of they hadn't had much luck they, and, and, and things have been going badly for them. And then you win and then the confidence returns and you're able to maybe produce a, a better performance against Brighton. I disagreed with people, and I maybe should have said it last week when when Gabby um, mentioned it, that they needed to get back to basics. I don't think you appoint somebody like Arteta and then ask him to go back to basics. I think he, as a manager, and I think maybe he's learned that, if I'm going to get the sack, I'm going to do it my way because there's no point changing. So um, he has chucked in a few of the younger players, and I think that's working for him because, you know, the expensive, whether it's wages in, in William or in transfer fee in Pepe, they weren't delivering and he tr- he trusted them for so long and now he's got Saka in a good position further up the pitch. Martinelli's back from injury. I think Smith Rowe has made a real big difference to them and you know, you're know you starting to see, I think, what he wants from them and you know if you can't rely on reputations because those players will get, would have got in the sack. Okay, so we've learned two things there. Mikel Arteta needs to stick by his principles yeah. and and secondly, you're intimidated by Gabby. I was, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really interesting one, though, Simon, isn't it? Because Mark's absolutely right there. The youngsters have come in. They've done really well. When senior pros haven't, when the senior pros are fit, one, what should he do? But two, how difficult is it as a manager to tell your senior pros you have to stay on the bench because you're not quite sure how they're going to react to that? Yeah, some managers are different. Some will bring the big hitters straight back in. Some will go with the loyalty of, of what the previous team had done, whether you're an experienced or a, a younger player. The younger players probably play with a little bit um, more freedom, desperate to get into the team and make an impact on their careers. And that's why 
they've, they've done so well. There's been so much inconsistency, hasn't there, over the Premier League season so far, and Arsenal have probably been a big, big example of that up to recently, and they get back-to-back victories. So um, this game's going to be an interesting game because off the back of a 5-0 drubbing, Sam Allardyce isn't going to be happy with his, no. with his team. It was He's, quite stinging with yeah. his criticism post-match as well, wasn't he? Yeah. Saying he doesn't know if they're actually wanting it enough and doing enough off the pitch as well as on to stay up. What, what did you make of that? Well, I, I would think he's looking for a reaction without a shadow of doubt. You can, you can sugarcoat it up as much as you want, but sometimes you have to let, let a rocket off and uh, hope you get a reaction from players. And we saw what they did against Liverpool, that they defended, put the bodies on the line. They didn't do that enough against, uh, against Leeds. I think you'll see him going back to a real resilient back eight, potentially. <laughs> And I think Sam, Sam's always been renowned for being a manager that has sort of set up his teams to be very hard to beat and then build, put building blocks in place and get to a certain level and then maybe go to the next level in a few months' time. Well, he, I think he'll go with the process of a point is a good starting point for us and then we'll try and get another point. And then all of a sudden, a little bit more confidence comes back and by doing being hard to beat, that gives you that opportunity. That's why, yeah, that's why I think it's going to be a tough game for Arsenal. Look, with Arsenal and West Brom, you never know what you're no. going to get with both no. teams, do you? So go on and give us a guess. I'm going to go Better nil nil. Selection. I'm nil, going to go nil nil because I don't think uh, I'm thinking Arsenal might not have enough to break down a Sam Allardyce team that's going to be set up to defend um, for the lives and, and a reaction from the game against Leeds. Yeah, Big Sam loves playing against the the big sides. He he does love making it horrible. Probably prefers playing against the big sides, and I. I think there will be a reaction to last night's performance as well. And I think Arsenal, uh, uh, despite back-to-back victories, are not where they need to be. I'm going for a draw as well. What's your bet, Fred? I'm Sanchez? going to go for a draw half-time, Arsenal full-time. I, I can see exactly Allardyce doing what, what you two guys are saying there and, and keeping it solid and getting the reaction. I'm just not sure that for 90 minutes they can keep anybody out really and Arsenal brought off Lacazette off the bench or you know it could be in Ketty, it could be a not quite sure who he's going to go with or bring off the bench but there might just be enough there to get the win eventually. Okay uh, on Sunday game preview five Chelsea versus Manchester City which we hope will be on so let's um, assume it will be. Uh, so I, I find it funny that Frank Lampard went on a 17 match unbeaten run they were talking about Chelsea possibly being title challengers. There's one win in five now, as, as a draw as well. And now people are saying it could turn ugly for him and he's under massive pressure. What do you make of it? It's just the inconsistency of the Premier League this year, isn't it? Um, that they've got, they've got a real strong squad, especially the top end of the pitch. Maybe one or two of them players have not quite hit it off. They've not really sort of hit the ground running. Um, but there's still a team that can score goals. There's still a team that are capable of winning football matches. They've just got to get the right balance. Conceding the goals they did against Arsenal the other night wasn't great. Um, and then when they get the opportunities, they've got to be ruthless as well. And, and that balance is key to them. What they were probably doing when they went on that real good run that they were hard to beat, but then clinical with the chances. Um, does Frank know his strongest team? I'm not quite sure he does. He, he's still, Abraham plays as a centre forward or Giroud. Yeah, we can talk about rotation and, and the other lads. Or Werner as a centre forward, yeah. but he's playing out on the left. But... Sometimes you can have too many options at your disposal and you're not quite sure which ones are, are the ones to go with um, game in, game out. Because every player, as we know, loves to be playing game by game, getting the consistency, getting the confidence. Um, I get the rotation because of the number of games, but somewhere if you can get a settled team, it would probably help them more. I, I just don't see how Frank had said before the game, look, this is a team under pressure, before Arsenal I'm talking about, under pressure, make sure you don't give him anything. There's only so much he can do. And I, again, I find it interesting that it almost feels like someone has to be under pressure. <laughs> it's been Ole Gunnar Solskjaer for most of the season. Then it's been Mikel Arteta. One good result against Chelsea and Chelsea having a couple of bad performances. And now it's Frank Lampard. Yeah, that's that, but that's what they sign up. That's what Simon and the rest sign up for, isn't it? I mean, it's just the way it is. Particularly, is, is it right? Do you agree with it? No, I think I think that I think that managers need a certain amount of time, you know, before they get put under pressure. And in, in terms of Chelsea, I think it, it, it's quite difficult to to quite work it out because Roman Abramovich in the past has been quite trigger happy. They've spent a lot of money. 
But then if you spend a lot of money with mainly bringing in foreign players, then you, you've got to give them time to become a team. So, um, and if you employ a young manager who's only had sort of two years experience previously, what are you hoping for? You know, there will be mistakes along the way. That's part of it, isn't it? So um, it's a bit like United when they appointed Solskjaer. They knew they weren't getting the finished article, but they felt there were other parts of it, the connection with the club, etc., that made that worthwhile. So it's the same with Chelsea, but I do agree with Simon that um, I'm not sure that Lampard knows what his best 11 is at the moment. He's still searching for it. I mean, if I was to offer him one bit of advice, it would be to play Timo Werner through the middle. Um, I think if you spend that much money on a striker, don't play him as a winger. Mm, I, I think he wants to know his best 11, but I don't think the players have been playing well enough recently. Yeah. And I also think while there's a lot of talent, I don't think there's enough leadership there. Yeah. Thiago Silva, yes, but doesn't speak English. Jorginho, yes, but perhaps not good enough now to get into the, the first 11. Olivier Giroud, is, yes, but he's in and out the side. Yeah. But in terms of the players you would think would be the best 11, I don't think there's any real characters there. In terms of City, have, have they turned the corner, do you feel? Semi-final of the Carabao Cup, good win at Southampton. Should have beaten Newcastle by four or five. Well, you talk about man who's been under pressure. <laughs> Pep was being under pressure early part, wasn't he? When they were sort of below halfway in, in the division. Does it look like they've just turned the corner? Potentially, they're still not playing with that free-flowing style that we, we've been used to over a number of years now. And how they play a bit more defensive, a few more clean sheets. Um, Aguero's been out injured, obviously. He's played, what, 15, 20 minutes of the night. So it'd be, be big for him to come back. I think when you're looking at the comparisons between the two teams and the stats that I looked at earlier was that I think Chelsea scored 10 more goals than Man City. And that's that's... That's not really something that you you would put Manchester City into that bracket. Normally they're in front of everybody else, aren't they? They've been the entertainers. They've been winning four, five, sixes at, at times. Now it's one nil, two nils. Maybe they're just finding the feet again now and they're about to really kick on in the second half of the season. So how do you see this game developing and what's your bet for its selection? I'm going to go 4-2-2. Two, two. I see it uh, being a decent entertaining game. As I said, I think City are just turning the corner. Chelsea have got the firepower reaction maybe again from, from the Arsenal game. So I'm going to go for 2-2 two, two with a with a Sterling um, Man City goal. That's a good bet. I'm going for a score draw as well. What's yours? I'm going to go for uh, Man City to win. I think if you want to bump up the price maybe to do so, actually I'm under three and a half goals um, in, in the game. Chelsea, a lot of their goals have come against the, the smaller teams. They have struggled against the, um, the bigger sides. And Chelsea, uh, City's clean sheet record really mm. improving with Stones alongside Diaz. OK, game preview six, Monday Night Football, Southampton against Liverpool. As, as we speak, we don't know the, the result of the Newcastle-Liverpool game. But how impressed have you been with, with Southampton and the work that Ralph Hasenhutl has done? I mean, when you think about last season, that 9-0 demolishing or, you know, from Leicester, and yet where they are now is quite well, incredible. It's, it's it? remarkable because there would have been a lot of other clubs would have sacked him after that result. I, were, I was in a hotel before a game and watching the game and going, wow, never seen this. And if he can survive this, then then he's done really well. And full credit to the board that decided to bring him in in the first place, have a, a terrible night, but then to back him and stick with him and give him time. Because we all, every manager needs time. You need the backing of, of when you're going through a little sticky period. I've had it as a manager going through a bad period and then all of a sudden... They're stuck with you and you've got a promotion at the end of that season. And um, and he signed a new deal. He's got a very workmanlike team. Don't score loads and loads of goals, but are very difficult to uh, to play against. Um, Danny Ings has been out for a few games. Um, che Adams has not scored too many goals, but you've got to be impressed with what they're doing because mm. um, um, they're a tough tough team to play against. Yeah, Liverpool need to be careful not to give away too many set pieces as well. With <laughs> Wall Prowse, yeah. I mean, it's... Um, it's, it's a weapon, isn't it, to, to use, um, I, I, again, that they don't need to be as prolific from open play when Ball Prowse can put it on the head of, I mean, Vestergaard's out, and I think that that could be quite Big an important play. one because he's playing really well. But in both boxes, um, you know, because he, him and Bednarek can get on the end of, of corners and Ball Prowse can curl them in from 25, 30 yards, one of the best free kick takers in the Premier League, no doubt about that. And interesting game because Hassan Hootal sort of models his approach on Klopp um, and you know he's very much seen as somebody that, that sort of took the Klopp blueprint and uh, has tried to impose that on sort of you know w with his own bits as well but he you know the, the basis of what he does is, is taken from Klopp. So how do you see this game developing? 
Well, we, we don't know what Liverpool's team's going to be. Are they going to get any injuries back um, after the, the game at Newcastle? Um, will he rotate? I, st I still see Liverpool winning this game. I think they're going to be back on track. Um, I'm going to go for an away win with a clean sheet and go 2-0. And I think Salah might just get a penalty. So 2-0 Liverpool with a Salah goal. OK, I'm, I'm, our prediction's very close this week, to be fair. I, I, I think it'll be similar to when Southampton played Man City. Excellent side, but against the very best, they just struggle. I think Liverpool will nick it. I'm going for 1 0 in this one. What about you, Mark? I'm going Liverpool 2 1. Um, Liverpool have won their last six against Southampton. Could be a close game, but not close enough for Saints' point of view. OK, uh, let's go to our fantasy football picks where each of us pick a player we think will star this weekend. Who have you gone for, Si? Um, again, much as it hurts me, I'm going to go for Son at Tottenham. I think the way the game's going to be, the open spaces. Um, for him to pick up the ball, run at Leeds back four. Um, I think he, he'll have an opportunity to, to score, which I've predicted. Oh, hopefully my bet's not right, being a Leeds fan, as I mentioned. Uh, but also, having that space, he might just have an assist as well. So I'm going to go for Son to be to be my fantasy player. Yeah, it must hurt you that, but you can understand exactly where you're coming from. And that. Um, it's my professional side. Professional, <laughs> yeah. The head, not the heart yeah. speaking. I'm, I'm going right to the, the bargain bucket uh, of, of the value sort of point of view, but Smith Rowe at Arsenal, I mean, obviously, you know, he's really cheap on, on the fantasy football game because he wasn't expected to play, but actually last couple of matches, he's been in that number 10 role in the Europa League, He's been assisting and scoring. He didn't quite look the... Uh, he looked the part harder's field, but I think they were a struggling team, maybe didn't necessarily play to his strengths, but you could see he had quality. Arsenal fought a lot of him for a long time. He's just coming through now. I think Smith Rowe could have a big second half of the season. OK. You mentioned Sadio Mane a couple of times. I mentioned him last week. I thought he'd absolutely fill his boots. And when he scored against West Brom early on, I thought it could be a hat-trick here. Didn't happen in the end. This week, I've gone for Jamie Vardy. Um, Leicester play Monday. Newcastle play Wednesday. Vardy didn't play the full 90 minutes on Monday either. And I think he'd be absolutely fresh, really sharp. And I think this is a game where Newcastle will feel they can't necessarily sit back at home and there'll be plenty of space for, for Vardy in behind. So Jamie Vardy for me. OK, Team Treble. Each of us pick a, a team that we think will win this weekend. Who have you gone for, Si? Um, I'm trying to get a little bit of value. And it is value. Well, it could be value if it works out. I'm going to go for the 0-0 um, West Brom Arsenal. I just think hopefully Sam gets them sorted, gets that clean sheet. Arsenal don't, don't get penalties or don't uh, are able to break them down. So I think it's somewhere around about the 3-1 to one price, um, which I think is, is a good price. And... With your, with your bets as well, we might come in. Let's hope so. Mark, have you gone for uh, You just mentioned Jamie Vardy. I'm going for Leicester um, to win at Newcastle. As soon as I saw the Brendan Rodgers team at Crystal Palace, I was thinking, who have they got next? Because he rested, I think he maybe rested too many. Um, he had a lot of his star men on the bench, but that does mean they'll be good to go um, next time out. They're really good away from home, won six of eight. Um, probably would have beaten Palace if, if Ian Acho scores yeah. the pen anyway. Um, yeah, and I think Newcastle really could have a bad second half of the season. OK, I'm dipping into the championship. I'm going Luton to beat QPR. Neither side, I have to say, in great form, although Luton had a good win last night. But QPR haven't won in eight, as we were speaking, and, and won just once on the road. So I think with Luton being tough at home, I fancy Luton here. 16 to 1 between the three of us. Right, nice. Stick a pound on that. And that's it, Si. You enjoyed it? Yeah, great. Good to see you both. What are you up to the new year? Uh, well, I'm doing Newcastle, Liverpool. Hopefully get back to work somewhere. Um, it's seen a few jobs coming up and uh, yeah, just wait for that opportunity again. Desperate to go back. They've got the hunger, desire. Um, if not, I'll just come back and work with you a lot again. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. That's a bad consolation, really, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, the booby prize. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Mark, good to see you as well. Thank, Thank you, you very much indeed. OK, that's it. That's it for this week's Different League show. Uh, sponsored by Betfred, we do hope you've enjoyed it. And all I can say is, well, look, if you're going to gamble, please gamble responsibly. And everyone here on behalf of Betfred and also the Racing Post, Happy New Year.